Well, good morning, church. We're glad you're with us today. If you would not mind, would you stand up with us? We're going to worship together. This is a time for you just to, uh, through song, just to reach out to God. my soul there is glory to behold it's the beauty of the living Lord God be praised God be praised fix your eyes the only one who satisfies the time has come to lift him high God be God be praised, praise the Lord, my soul, with everything that's in me, praise the Lord, my soul, with everything that's in me. that he hasn't kept. God be praised. God be praised. Come on, church. Praise the Lord, my soul. With everything that's in me, praise the Lord, my soul. With everything that's in me, praise the Lord. Jesus forgives all our sin, who crowns us with mercy and every good thing, is rich in compassion, abounding in love. Praise to the Father, the Spirit, the Son, who heals our diseases, forgives all our sin, who crowns us with mercy and every good thing, is rich in compassion, abounding in love. Praise to the Father, the Spirit, the Son, who heals our diseases, forgives all our sin, crowns us with mercy in every good thing, is rich in compassion, abounding in love. Praise to the Father, the Spirit. Come on! Praise the Lord, my soul, with everything that's in me. the 
countryside. Welcome to church. I'm so glad you're here. Our students are going back to the youth room. We um, are glad to have you here this Sunday. It's gorgeous outside. Good for you for coming into church. Um, You're going to be blessed today. We've got some in, um, cool things to share with you. And um, one of the things that I want to talk to you about is um, the information you'll find in your program. So if you would pull that out, you were handed one as you walked in the door. Inside that program is a connection card. And I want to ask you to fill that out to whatever degree you feel comfortable in doing so. What? Oh, that's right. They're in the back of the chairs. So don't get it in your program. Get it in the back of the chair. I did sit in church last service, I promise. Apparently, I'm not paying attention to details. Um, anyways, there's a blue box on the back wall where you can drop those cards in at any time. And it's also where you can put in your tithes and offerings. But what's happening in the life of the church? This week, we have Lunch Bunch coming up, and if you're 
fairly new to us and don't under, know what that's all about, if you are free at lunchtime, maybe you're free because you're retired or maybe you're free because you just can take a long lunch. You have that of freedom in your schedule. We meet once a month at different restaurants around town. And on Wednesday, we're going to be at Gustav's over there in Kaiser Station. So we'd love to have you. And let us know that you're coming. Uh, you can, um, so we have a table big enough, right? We want room, there's room for you. So on our website, countrysidechristianchurch.org forward slash events, you'll find that event there. And coming up on Saturday, we have an event for women. We are committed to being followers of Jesus. And if we're going to do that, it's be, we want to know and understand the character of God. So we are doing a once a month Bible study here on Saturday mornings called Women in the Word. And we are studying the names of God. And we would invite you to come and join us at any time. We love our community and we want to unleash compassion on our community. And one of our favorite ways to do that is coming up um, with Trunk or Treat, which will happen on Halloween. It's a Monday night. We um, will fill our front parking lot here with uh, so many different cars and vehicles. One time there was even a boat. Um, and where kids will come by and we will give them candy and provide a safe Halloween alternative. There's so many ways to be involved in that, and you would find um, a sign-up for that on our events page as well. And you might have noticed the bins, of uh, the, color, the orange and black bins in the foyer. That's where we're collecting candy. We look forward to serving 1,200, 1,400 people who will come to our church that night, so it's a lot of fun. And lastly, one of the ways that we unleash compassion um, on a broader scale around the world is through Operation Christmas Child. And the table there in the back corner has boxes. If you want to pack a box that will get shipped all over the place, um, many different countries around the world, you can do that. So uh, I want to invite Mary Barreros, a long time. We she argued with me. I said she's been here for a decade, and she says it was nine and a half years, you guys. Can we just round up to a decade? Mary has been a part of our church all this time, and um, she came and immediately jumped into ministry because that's just who she is, and she has been the toddler whisperer for these 10 years. Two and three-year-olds, it's a big transition, to, you know, life, and she has made that transition so great for so many of our little ones, but Mary has a new adventure coming, and we're going to tell you about that, and we're going to spend a minute to pray for her as she gets to do this. What you might not know about Mary Barreros is that she was a missionary in the Philippines for 25 years, and she's been stateside for a good long while now. Uh, and she has two sons, one that lives here in Oregon, but she, her oldest son is a missionary and ministering in the Philippines right now. And so she's going to um, take the next adventure of life and spend part of her year in the Philippines and then part of the year here because she's got family in both areas, right? And she's going to partner with her son Jordan in what he's doing there, and that is called Care and Grace Ministries. So we're very excited for you. I'm so sad. I'm so sad for our two and three year olds, but I'm very excited for all of the children that are going to get to be loved on and served by you. Now, uh, Jordan went there uh, to plant, to help plant churches and equip pastors and, um, and then many other things. As you can imagine, in a, in a very poor country like they are, there are so many physical needs, just the basics. But, but the vision is to plant churches and to build communities there, which we're all about because we want to help people know and follow Jesus one person at a time. And that's what is, is happening in these churches. Right now, how many churches... Have, has he been able to help get started? Um, when he went over there, there were about five churches, and now they've planted 31 churches, but not by himself, <laughs> with a lot of good prayer and support and uh, pastors and church leaders over there helping him as well. Now, when you were a missionary in the Philippines, one of the, the biggest portion of your ministry, from what I understand, you guys, she has so many stories. So if you want to hear all of it, you need to talk to Mary face to face. But she started a children's home and raised 300 children like they were long term 
children in this home, and even more than that, kids who came in for short, shorter periods of time. Um, and so you have a lot of connections in the Philippines, and besides just your son and daughter-in-law and two grandkids that live there. But, um, but some of the time that you go there is going to be to partner in ministry with, uh, with Karen and Grace and um, serving children in Laulo which is the area, if you want to Google it, you can look on Google Maps and see where Lalo is. Uh, but what is, what is currently happening? Like, what are, they, what are you building and establishing in that area? Well, our, my son goes out to our um, mountain villages, go in his base is in the Lalo area. Um, these people are indigenous people that he works with. Um, they're like the indigenous and treated like we often treated the indigenous people in this country before and others, and pushed out and pushed out and pushed out. And they are mostly uneducated and uh, or just a very small education. And so he goes out to them and takes the word of God to them and starts training people in the church to be leaders and pastors. <clears throat> they come, when he first started, they came to his house and he would teach them. They would have a day when they would meet for prayer. They would have a day when they had Bible studies and mentoring and things like that. But now there are so many of them that their little tiny house of their own can't hold them. <clears throat> so he has to go out to different areas, um, the villages in this area and the villages in this area, and they'll get together and do that. But he would like to build a building big enough that they can all come together so they can have fellowship together as well as being taught. And it will make it a lot easier on him, of course, not having to travel around as much. And one thing I didn't say last service, but he grew up in the Philippines because we live there. And so he speaks the language very, very well. And he's learning different Agta dialects, but um, because he knows the language, then he can really relate to the people. And uh, so they want to build this um, meeting hall and uh, be able to meet together and everybody can come at once. And also to start an Agta school because, um, like I said, they're not treated well. They go Even if they can get into public school, which many don't because they don't have money to do that, um, they're not treated well necessarily in the school itself. And so they want them to be able to get a real good education they have their own school, then their teachers, Christian attitude and all of that will be there and they can get a really good education and be able to um, get a life for themselves, so to speak, as well as, of course, learning about the Lord. Uh, one interesting thing you told me, Mary, about the Ogta people, it's like if, if there's a church service, they're deciding, do I go gather food for the day or do I go to church? And so even just being able to provide food at their church services, like when they do gather, to have rice to distribute to the people there. I mean, that, that's that's not our experience, right? Like right now you're probably thinking, which fast food are we going to go to on our way home? You know, they don't have that option. Like going to church is sacrificing the gathering of food, and that that's to give you an idea of the poverty of, of where they're at. So, um they they want they do other things um, to help in the education to the tutoring of students. You know you can imagine what it's like. Their parents are not or very, have very little education, and so there's no help for the children. So that those are the kinds of things that they will do. We will um, we want to support what Mary's doing, and there will be from time to time collections um, of like gently used shoes or clothes or school supplies or those kinds of things that we will bring to your attention, and so that we can partner with. But um, even just learning how to take care of their, their their themselves, like hygiene and and health and those kinds of things, are the services that. Um, that are provided through Care and Grace Ministry. So uh, we want to pray for Mary. Um, she, this is not the last time we're going to see her. She's going to be back. But um, we love, because she's been a teacher in our Kid Venture Children's Ministries, last Sunday we got to talk to the kids about how we're sending our own missionary. Um, and the kids um, offering is going to go to help support what Teacher Mary is doing. And we'll be um, sharing with them so that they have, like, they know Mary. And so the, to, to know a real-life missionary and have that relationship. 
But we, I want to invite any of Mary's life group uh, members or any of our elders to come up on stage when we, as we pray for her. And I want to ask Mary this question. How can the church, how can Countryside, your church family, come alongside you over this next several months? Well, no missionary goes it alone. And we have to have support from our churches, from God's family, through prayer and encouragement and contact, too, as is possible. And also, we also have to eat and pay fares and back to buy gasoline and all that kind of stuff. So we can't do it all by ourselves. And even the prayers, if you can't do anything else, is wonderful. We need that support and backup. And we know the Lord is with us, but we love having people pray for us. You got it. So George is going to um, read some scripture and pray. And then John, I'll ask if you, would you mind praying? And Doug, and then we will we'll carry on. Well, as I said in the first service, Mary, it's been a pleasure coming to know and to love you from both Holly and me and for the life group in particular. Uh, the Apostle Peter wrote an encouraging letter to people that were, that were uh, missionaries in a sense, and he had these words to say for them in 1 Peter 4, starting with verse 10. As each has received a gift and Mary in particular, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's various grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Father, thank you that we can come to you and lift up Mary and uh, present her to you uh, in what is uh, coming up in the near future. Father, would you go before her, protect her heart and her mind. You would guard her. And uh, Lord, we uh, look forward to hearing what you are going to continue to do in and through her in the Philippines and uh, strengthen her body, strengthen her mind in her spirit as she serves you. And Father, thank you. Um, thank you for your son Jesus and what she is going to be doing in his name and spreading the good news, the gospel, to people in a faraway land. Thank you. Father, you said in your word that those that wait on you will renew their strength, mm -hmm. that they would mount up like eagles with wings of great length. Run and not grow weary, walk and not faint. So we just ask that you just give Mary um, all the strength, all the encouragement that she is supported and loved as she goes over there and chooses to intentionally minister to a group of people that, that need you, that need you in their life. And so we are so thankful for... Uh, Mary and the example that she's setting for many of us, Father. And so we just ask your blessing on her. We ask that your presence fills her. And we know just from her, her years with us here, uh, she has that gentle nature. She is so approachable, so lovable. And people respond to that, Father. So we just ask your blessing on her. We ask that you fill her with the, your Holy Spirit, uh, cover her, and we ask blessings on her through the name of your great son, Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning. My name is John. I'm one of the pastors here at Countryside Christian Church. Glad that you're with us this morning. Uh, these uh, these nice, bright, sunny days, I think there are other places you could have chosen to be, but you are here. Some of you are here, though, because of drugs. I get that. You were drug here, right? So uh, special welcome to you, all of you online uh, that are watching during this service and engaging with us. Just a special welcome to you as well. We are um, going to piggyback last week's sermon in Psalm 150, 
where we learned last week that we were to praise the Lord. Now, if you weren't with us, uh, Psalm 150 is just a few verses long. I want to encourage you to go back and read through it like a thousand times uh, because there's just a few verses, and it's about praising the Lord. And the, the line in there that I really that's resonated this week with me is that everything that has breath, praise the Lord. And so if you're in this room this morning and you are breathing, praise the Lord. It's just praise the Lord. Now, we are also learning that praise and engaging with God helps with breakthroughs in our lives. It gets our focus off of ourselves. And today, we're going to take a look at a guy in the Bible. He's a rock star worship leader. And um, he wrote a psalm. He wrote in his journal some words that we can learn from if we just take some time and walk through this passage of Scripture. And what I'm seeing here is that uh, a way for us to grasp what we're going to look at, uh, uh, Chris Brown, a pastor in California, said these words. These are very, very deep, deep words that will change your life. You should actually write these down when you see them on, on, on the board. These are just so moving. Are you ready? What you look at is what you see. What you look at is what you see. It's profound. When you see something, you've looked at it. Another way to say what we're going to talk about today is this. What you look at is what you see with an eternal perspective, not a now, but an eternal perspective. Everything looks different. And I want to encourage us uh, to, together today that we keep our eyes forward looking and not just in the next few days, few months, few years, that we look beyond that with an eternal perspective as we walk through life, as we journey through life, as you're being discipled and discipling other people. Let's keep our eyes way into the future and we're going to see why as we work through this Psalm, Psalm 73. But let's pray as we get into the Word of God. Father, thank you for the Word, the very Word of God. Thank you for your Son, Jesus, the Word, who became flesh and dwelt, lived among us. Father, I would ask that as we go way back into your Scriptures, way back into the Psalms, that as we study what Asaph wrote down, Lord, that this would come alive. We would learn from it, and we'd be able to take these words And apply them in our life today as we live out our lives for you. Father, I understand that there are people here today and there are those that are watching who are struggling. I mean, there's hurts, there's habits, there's hang-ups, there's issues. And Father, I would ask that right now as we focus in, first that we would be reminded and that even in the quietness of our minds, we would praise you, praise you for who you are. And would you start a new work today in our lives from what we are going to study In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, as we journey through life, I don't know about you, you you don't necessarily have to raise your hand, but I think sometimes in life we've been given a raw deal. Some of us, we just have been given a raw deal. Some of us, by our own choices, we create our own raw deals in life as we journey through life. We just set ourselves up for something that's not so good. But we're going to see today a choir director or worship leader He uh, journaled for us, and it's Psalm 73, he journaled for us some issues that he was having as he was walking, journeying through life. And so if you would turn there, that'd be cool. You're also going to see the passages for uh, Psalm 73 on the uh, flat screens today on the TVs. Verse 1 of Psalm chapter 73 says, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. This is how he starts. This is how Asaph starts. He acknowledges who God is. He says, praise the Lord. And he says, God is good to those who love him. Particularly at this time, he was talking about Israel. But God loves you. God is a God of love. And so we want to acknowledge that as well. But Asaph goes off and he writes something that's very telling. He says, but as for me, my feet almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. I nearly lost grip, he's saying. Life was crazy. I I, I don't know what's happening here, but I almost slipped. Keynote there is I almost. My feet almost slipped. Almost lost my foothold. 
But something happened where he struggled. And he goes on to say, For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Here is this worship leader in the temple. Here's this rock star of a worship leader. And he's the guy that leads the choir. And he, and he does the music. And, and he has an issue. Now, I'm not particularly talking about our worship pastor. And this is not why we're talking about this, John. But what, what, what it is, is I think it applies to all of us. It just happened to be that this guy held an important ministry position. And you would think, like, well, I thought those guys, those gals, they don't have issues. I'll tell you what. I have issues. Your pastors have issues. We're people, too. I, I, if you're wearing pants, I put my pants on the same way you did this morning. Yeah, we are all together in this journey of life. And we all have struggles, we have hurts, we have habits, we have hang-ups. And sometimes our focus gets off of where it's supposed to be. We don't remind ourselves that our perspective and our view and what we're looking at should be an eternal perspective, but it's on the here and now for I envied, he said, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And Asaph, he'd been checking the people out around him. He's been doing his ministry job. He's been taking care of God's people and the role that he's been given. But he also started looking around and he was seeing some things and he writes these down. Asaph has been watching the other team and he writes these down. And there's four words in this one verse I want to uh, take a look at. First word or the first two words, are arrogant and wicked. Here is this godly man who started looking around, and this is what he sees. These people are arrogant and they're wicked. Arrogance refers to people who want to be noticed. Look at me. Look at what I have. Look at what I have done and my accomplishments. Here's what Proverbs 16, 5 tells us. Everyone who is arrogant Arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord, be assured. He will not go unpunished. Man. Wicked. What is wicked? Wicked emphasizes the guilt of those who choose to live a life by choice and doing what is evil in the sight of God. Some who have yet to come to Christ live in the ignorance of their wickedness. That's why we need to be bold in telling people about Jesus, that Jesus loves you, and that he died for you, and there is great freedom in believing in Christ and walking through life with Christ. But Asaph, he looked, and he saw the wickedness, and it bothered him, and he got his eyes off of, G off of God. He was unfocused. In Psalm chapter 10, it says, the wicked are always saying, there's nothing to worry about. His mouth is filled with cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue are the mischief, are mischief and iniquity. Wicked is what he put his eyes on and what he started to see and he started to question. And there's a third word in that passage that says prosperity. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Prosperity is a great biblical word. God wants us to be prosperous but in the right way, through the right methods, in his way, in God's way, not in man's way, not in the world's way, but in God's way. And Asaph got his eye looking around, and he was seeing this prosperity. And what he did is he ceased to being concerned about the sin. He saw the sin, but he started to think less about the sin and more about the success of those that were living in the world. He started focusing instead on the success of the sinful. And when Asa, where's his focus? It now comes off of God and it is now on the people around him and they're accumulating things. They're arrogant and they're prosperous. They're wicked. That would be a challenge to me, but here we see that he is, he's almost, his foot almost slipped. What is envy? Envy, uh, jealousy, and uh, covet or covetousness, they tend to play, uh, dance around the same idea, but they are different things. But they lead, all of them lead to a problem. 
And uh, Asaph saw this, and he was envious. I envied these people because they had, and he did not. The Bible tells us that envy is not good. As a matter of fact, one of the words that, is, that we'll use is the word covet, and God actually put that on his top ten of things not to do. Thou shalt not covet. What aren't you supposed to co- covet? Well, you're not supposed to covet your neighbor's house or your neighbor's wife, his male or female slave, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Don't, don't start looking at it and going, I'm kind of jealous and envious, and now I covet this, and pretty soon, where, where's our focus? It's not, it's not in the eternal, it's on the here and now and the things that are around me. Asaph got his eyes off of off of God, and he put him on something else. The next eight verses or so, verses 4 through 12, breaks down what he observed. And I'm not going to read the verses word for word, but I'm going to read the pronouns, uh, the, the, or not the pronouns, the, uh, the single words uh, that jump out of verses 4 through 12. Here they are, and let's see, that, and they won't be up there, but let's see where this lies. They, there, they, they, there, there, they themselves, there, there, they, they, oh, there's more. There, 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 them, they, this is what the wicked are like. Always carefree, they go on amassing wealth. Where was Asaph's perspective? Where was it? They. they. The, yeah, it's not on God anymore, worship pastor leading people into the throne room of God, man of faith, his eyes got off of that and they started to wander. I think that we can have the tendency to do that too. There's things around us we may question, we might even like, we may even want, and then we go and we get it. It's a trap. And we see Asaph here, he writes, man, my foot almost slipped. I like that because it gives hope for the rest of the story. We need to keep an eternal eternal perspective on God and not on the things around us. It's hard. It's a hard thing to do. And then he goes on to write this very interesting verse. Psalm 73, verse 13 tells us, Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocent innocence. He had looked around, he has saw, he's seen this stuff, and he would say, maybe in our perspective, Jesus, this just isn't working out anymore. I, I'm looking around, and it looks like all these yahoos and wicked people, man, they're, they're doing pretty good. And I thought you were going to bless me because I'm your, eh, I'm your son. I'm your daughter. I'm seeing some things that don't quite match up in my mind as I look around. And I see other people are able to have certain things. They're being prosperous in their life. I think our perspective needs to change. We need to keep our eyes on Christ. And we see here by example, Asaph says, my eyes got off of eternal things. My eyes began to focus on the things that are around me. And here's how he unpacks the rest of the psalm. I think the first thing here that I would encourage all of us to do, wherever you're at in your walk with Jesus, either not in a relationship with Jesus or you're in a relationship with Jesus Maybe it's waning, maybe it's not real strong, maybe it's super duper strong and things are really, really good in your discipleship journey. All through that spectrum, I would encourage all of us to pour your heart out to God. Just pour it out to be completely honest with him. God, our God, the heavenly father that we call father, wow, he can uh, handle everything that you have to say. He's got some pretty big shoulders. He's got a great big heart. And he wants to hear from us. He wants to have us pour 
out our hearts to him. Another example, and this is what Asaph's doing, but another example is the guy Job. I don't know if you've heard of Job. Job, there's this, a wonderful story of Job and what happens to him. Uh, but it doesn't uh, seem real wonderful in his life. Job is really, really rich. He's got a great wife, family, kids, lots of money, and uh, God takes it all away by allowing Satan to go in and destroy it. And so Job is sitting around uh, this for a while. Um, even his kids are killed. And so he's sitting around talking to his best buds, and they're trying to work this through. And they're giving him some wackadoodle advice about what he should do. Even his wife walks up to him and says, you need to curse God and get this thing over with. Yeah, his own wife. Ah, and he doesn't. He realizes that's not the right thing to do. Even though things are tough, I need to keep my perspective, my eyes on God. And he has this conversation. Go back to Job and read through it. He has a great conversation with God. And they work things out. And Job is blessed even more by keeping an eternal perspective. He wasn't perfect through this whole lifestyle pro process of thinking. But he questioned even in Isaiah, we're told to go and argue with God. Have you ever had an argument with God? <laughs> it's like, can you say that in church? Man, I tell you, I, I, I would be careful with this, but we're told we could do that. Isaiah tells us this. Review, God says to Isaiah, he says, review the past for me. Let's argue the matter together. State the case for your innocence. God wants us to bring our issues to him. He wants us to lay them at his feet. He wants us to unpack them, but he wants us to do it with the right heart. There's a key here. The Bible tells us also that the Lord is near to those who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. It's a heart matter, a heart issue. And so I would encourage you to pour your heart out to him when it's hurting, when you're struggling. The next thing that, as we go through this passage, is we see that we should probably think before we speak. Pretty basic. Think before you open your trap. It's a pretty simple rule. My mom used to tell me that, and I, I wish I would have learned that. Because, <laughs> you know, boy, think before you speak. He goes on, Asaph says, verse 15, if I had spoken out like that, if I had spoken the words that are in my heart and my mind to those around, if I had spoken like that, I would have betrayed your children. Here's this leader who said, if I were to have gotten on Facebook and lamb blasted the world, that would have done damage. That's a paraphrase for those of you who are purists. Man, church, we got to be careful. You know, your shorts might get bunched up, but you are not allowed to go out and say whatever you want to. It'll have consequences. Facebook will kill and destroy. Got to be careful. And so what do you do? Well, you go to the Lord. Asaph went to the Lord. But I thought in the New Testament where we're told to bear up one another's burdens. Absolutely. But there's an appropriate way to talk to people. It's not throwing stones. It is sharing your heart. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to be mad. It's okay to be angry. But Asaph went to God first. And he said, praise the Lord. You are a good God. And he started the conversation off that way. Then he revealed his heart and he spoke truth to his heavenly father. Be careful. I you, let's be careful in who we're talking to about what we're talking about because it could do damage to the church, to the body of Christ. Number three, the other thing that I see as we move through this passage is we need to get the big picture. What's the big picture here? Psalm uh, 73, 16 and 17 goes on to say, when I tried to understand all of this stuff, it troubled me deeply till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destination. Oh, perspective is everything. It's not always reality. Perspective is important. He's saying, 
when I try to understand all this stuff now, I, I, I looked around, I see all this, and I'm trying to get my mind, I'm trying to get my mind wrapped around it. It troubled me until I went to church, until I worshiped God, until I went to my prayer closet, shut the door, and I spoke to him, and I spent time with him, acknowledging and engaging in worship with God. Asaph went to church, and he brought his confusion under the truth of God. He presented it to God, and he had a conversation. I think it's great that we have the writings of it to learn from this morning. Verse 17 says, then I understood their final destination. That's important for us to remember too. There are two destinations. One is heaven, one is hell. And while we can say it's as simple as that, it's also, for one, very horrific. And for another, it's great perspective to keep in mind. Because the narrow gate with Jesus, the narrow path leads to eternal life. The wide path and the wide gate doesn't lead to Jesus. It leads to destruction. It leads to hell. And we need to understand the big picture that as we start to get our eyes on things that we're not supposed to be looking at, then we start getting envious and jealous and we get all worked up inside. We have to remember God's got this. My eternal perspective is probably better than theirs. They need Jesus. So what am I going to do about it? Then I understood their final destination. Surely you, God, place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. They've got some problems. May not seem like it right now. But eternal perspective keeps these things in perspective. All the things of this world, the desires will pass away. But the man, the person who does the will of God will live forever. I'm going to wrap up with this as we finish up the psalm. This morning, I would encourage all of us at whatever stage of relationship you are at with Jesus this morning, that we renew it, we re-engage one more time. We, we just acknowledge who God is. Renew your relationship right now with God. And so armed with a new perspective about God and the world, Asaph also sees himself clearly. He has a new perspective. He's refreshed and reminded about a perspective. It says in verse 21, it says, when my heart grieved, after he had thought through these things, when my heart grieved and my, and my spirit was embittered, I was a senseless, I was senseless and, and, and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. What's a brute beast look like? Broody. Yeah, he's brutally broody. This is just crazy, like a ca caged animal. He's got to get out. And, uh, he's going to just rip some stuff up. And Asaph, oh, man, what, what a confession. When my heart grieved, when I went to worship and I was con con convicted of these things and God reworked in my life as I confessed these things and had a little chat with him about it, my spirit, my mind, my heart turned to him and I realized that was just kind of dumb. That was dumb. That was stinking thinking. I was like a brute beast. And then in worship, then in worship, he reengages. Check this out. He renews his relationship. Verse 23, yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. 
But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of your deeds. People need to hear about Jesus, and they need to see it in our lives as we go about working and as we go to school and as we're at home with the kids. People need to see it, but they also need to hear it. They need to hear about Jesus. And so while we sometimes have these struggles where maybe even our faith comes into question because we're not sure God is at work, keeping eternal perspective, knowing that God is at work. Because what you look at is what you see. And with an eternal perspective, everything looks different. And because of Jesus and the eternal perspective that many of us have, it comes because of a great story that God worked out by sending his son Jesus to die on the cross for us. In the perspective of that, for those of us who have reached out and received Christ as Lord and Savior, our, sin, our sins have been forgiven. The wrath of God, the Father, he put his wrath on his own son Jesus. Our sins put on him. And so we're going to remember that this morning. There are four stations around the room with communion uh, elements in them, a little grape juice and a piece of bread. And you're going to eat and drink that, remembering this great horrific work that was done on the cross where under God's mercy, it didn't happen to you or me, but it happened to his only son, Jesus. But you guys, as we remember that in perspective, for those of us who have received Christ, that's not the end all. We receive this wonderful, wonderful relationship with Jesus. We remember him here at Countryside on a weekly basis as we take the communion elements, but we're also thinking future. As we look into the future, we have to consider what's going on now. And what's going on now is a crazy, crazy world. Crazy, absolutely insane, ridiculousness. So don't get your eyes on that. Let's refocus and refocus on Jesus. And because of the cross, for those of us who are Christ followers, there is a future to look forward to because Jesus, when he left, told us to make disciples. And as we're doing that here and now, helping people know and follow Jesus, he's preparing a place for you. So we celebrate that. And here's some really good news. The Bible tells us we're going to praise the Lord. Here's a perspective. Ready for this? Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah! For the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. Oh, man, one day in the future... Our perspective will be will be with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, forever. Keep your eyes on Him. Keep your eyes on Him. And as we work back, we remember for that to happen, Jesus had to die for us. So when you're ready, go to the table, eat and drink in remembrance of Jesus Christ and what He did for you, for me. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace of 
my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on the cursed Stay. 
shall pierce the night and I Sunday.